Bayesian methods are a valuable tool for any statistician or analyst to have. Knowing them can open up opportunities in an increasingly competitive job market. Despite their importance, Bayesian methods are often ignored in statistical coursework. In the past, they were difficult to use, but today, they're easier than ever to pick up. So in this video, I'm going to teach you a modern workflow for doing Bayesian statistics. If you're new here, my name's Christian and this is Very Normal, a channel for making you better at statistics. To do Bayesian statistics, you need to understand the role of Bayes' rule. In its most basic form, before you involve any sort of statistics, A and B here are simple events. Let's say that event A is having an extra cup of coffee in the morning, while B is staying up until midnight. Bayes' rule tells us how to calculate the probability that we have an extra cup of coffee given that we stayed up late. We take the reverse conditional, the probability that we stay up late given that we had an extra cup of coffee, multiply it by the probability we have an extra cup of coffee in general, and divide it by the marginal probability of staying up late. Intuitively, Bayes' rule can be seen as a mechanism for updating our probabilities. If P of A represents the plausibility of A before seeing B, then P of A given B represents an updated plausibility after seeing it. P of A is the prior probability, and P of A given B is the posterior probability. With that in mind, we can bring in statistics. From this lens, the B event becomes the data we observe for an analysis. This data is usually assumed to come from a parametric distribution like the normal or binomial, and I'll use theta to represent the general idea of a parameter, which replaces our A event. This is where frequentist statistics and Bayesian statistics diverge. From the frequentist perspective, data is assumed to be fixed and unknown. From the Bayesian perspective, the parameter is still unknown, but random. That is, data itself also has a probability distribution, which expresses what values we believe to be likely or unlikely. P of theta is the prior probability distribution of the parameter. That means that P of x given theta is the likelihood, a product of the probability distributions of the data conditioned on a particular value of theta. Technically speaking, the likelihood by itself isn't a true probability distribution, but this won't affect how we end up doing Bayesian statistics. P of x now represents the marginal probability of observing the data we got. The likelihood and prior are relatively easy to calculate once we pick a distribution for the data and the parameter. But the denominator is different. Since the data is observed, this probability is actually just a number. Just a very hard to calculate number. The reason for this is because this probability needs to marginalize the likelihood over all parameter values. This means either taking an integral or a sum over all possibly infinite parameter values. And in general, this is almost impossible to do. In the past, we've usually avoided this problem with conjugate families. A conjugate prior is a prior that results in a posterior distribution that comes from the same family, just with updated parameter values. But that's not what I want to do in this video. I want you to be able to use more general priors. Before computers were as powerful as they were now, this would have been impossible. But that was before. The tools have changed. Another way we can get the posterior distribution is to use Markov chain, Monte Carlo, or MCMC methods. MCMC enables us to sample from the posterior distribution without calculating that pesky denominator. We only need to specify the likelihood and the prior distribution. I explained the basic concept behind MCMC algorithms in my Metropolis video, so watch that if you're interested in learning more. In a nutshell, MCMC algorithms generate a sample whose distribution is the posterior distribution. While we may not know the exact analytic form of the posterior, having a sample from it is just as good. Instead of needing to implement MCMC ourselves, we can use tools that smarter people than us have already made. One of these tools is called STAN. STAN is a programming language, and it's the main tool that we'll be using to do Bayesian statistics in this video. It facilitates Bayesian analysis because it helps us run an efficient Monte Carlo algorithm. All we need to do is provide the data and statistical model. For this video, I'll be using R and STAN together, but STAN can also be used with other languages with Python, MATLAB, and Julia. To use STAN, you need to install it on your computer. And in order to work, STAN needs a C++ compiler, which needs to be installed separately. This process will depend on what operating system you're on, but the STAN site provides some clear instructions on how to do this. Since I'm using R to work with STAN, I need to also install the R STAN library. For those of you who are really eager to just work with STAN, there's also a STAN playground that you can use in your browser. I'll put the links in the description. I'll be using a simple Bayesian analysis to guide this tutorial. In this example, we have 20 binary trials, and I'm going to model each one as a Bernoulli trial with the parameter theta, where theta now represents the probability that the trial will take the value 1. I need a prior distribution for theta, so I'm going to use a beta distribution with both parameters set to 1. 
This creates a uniform distribution over all the possible values of theta, and it reflects a belief on my part that any value is just as good as any other. Like I just showed you earlier, the beta prior is actually a conjugate prior, which means we don't actually need to use stand to do this analysis. While that's true, this conjugacy will still be helpful in drawing parallels to how the analysis would be done in STAN. To understand a typical STAN workflow, let's go back to our expression for Bayes' rule. To get a posterior distribution, there are four ingredients I have to specify for STAN. I need to specify what our observed data is, since it's used in our likelihood. Then, I need to specify what distribution should be used for this likelihood. Third, I need to define the parameters that are used in the likelihood. And finally, we need to specify a prior for these parameters. We'll describe all of these in a STAN program, which is denoted with the STAN extension. STAN programs are divided into blocks, and these blocks roughly correspond to the different parts of Bayes' rule. A block starts with the keyword and is followed by some curly brackets. Within these blocks, we can declare all the things that we need for the Bayesian analysis. First is the data block, where we describe the data that STAN will be using. I'm going to list two variables in this block capital N and Y. N will describe the sample size of the data. To fully specify the variable, we need to describe its structure and its type. In this case, N is just an integer. And then we finish that line with a semicolon. Next is the data, which I've named lowercase y. The data is binary and it's a collection of values, so we can describe it as an array of integers of size N. Notice that we use the previous sample size to help set up the Y vector. To better describe the data, we can also set up lower and upper bounds on the data in angled brackets. Next is the parameters block, where as you might expect, we describe the parameters that are used in the model. The only parameter here is theta, and it's a real number between 0 and 1. And I can do the similar to how I specified the data, substituting int for real. There's also another type of program block called a transform parameters block, and this block is also used to describe parameters, but specifically parameters that are functions of parameters defined in our first parameter block. For example, we could declare that we want the odds to be a parameter in this model, and we'd specify it as theta over 1 minus theta. Finally, we have the model block, where we describe both the likelihood of the data and the prize of the parameters. Here, I gave data a beta 1 1 model as the prior. Distributions are conveyed with this tilde symbol, similar to mathematical notation. This beta function here is one of several functions that Stan has for describing common distributions. We'll do something similar with the data, giving it a Bernoulli distribution and using theta as the parameter within it. By itself, the Stan file doesn't do much. It only describes the Bayesian model. To actually run the MCMC and get a posterior distribution, we need to hop back into R. First, I'll bring in two libraries, rstan and posterior. RStand contains the functions that will let us run the MCMC, and the posterior library makes it easier to work with the sample. I'll generate the binary data with the rbinom function, where I've programmed it to produce 20 Bernoulli trials. I've set the value of data equal to 30%, and you'll see this reflected in the posterior distribution. Before we give it to Stan, we need to prepare it to match the specifications of the data block we wrote in the Stan program. This is normally done with the named list, so I'll make one and name it data. We're going to take both this list and the STAN program we wrote and stick them into a function called STAN. There are lots of other parameters that I can tune in the STAN function, but this will be enough for now. If I run this, you'll be able to see the MCMC algorithm run in real time and we'll finally get what we wanted, a sample from the posterior distribution. Some of you might be suspicious. Wow, that was easy. What's the catch? The catch is you have to check that the MCMC algorithm performed well and actually produced a reliable sample. In this case, we're dealing with a relatively simple model, so Stan had no problem sampling from it, but this won't always be the case. In this crash course, we're going to examine two convergence diagnostics provided by Stan. With this fitted Stan model, we can get a summary of it by giving it as an input to the summary function. You can see that the summary provides some descriptive statistics on both data and this LP value, which represents the value of the log posterior. The diagnostics are contained here in the NF and R hat columns. NF represents effective sample size. Due to the nature of how MCMC works, the samples in this posterior distribution are correlated with each other, and this correlation serves to decrease the amount of information contained in our sample. The total number of samples we had in the original sample was 4,000, but these effective sample sizes will almost always be much lower. For our purposes, we want this number to be reasonably large. I can already hear complaints in the comments about what reasonably large is, so I'll give you a reference. In his book on Bayesian inference, Andrew Gunman suggests that your effective sample size should be at least 100. 
we can always increase the number of MCMC samples we generate so that our effective sample size is always adequately large. Here, we have much more than 100 effective sample sizes for theta, so we're good. The next diagnostic value we'll check is this value, r hat. r hat is also known as the potential scale reduction. I'm not gonna cover it in detail here, but the important factor you need to know is that r hat should be close to one for all of your parameters. Stan will actually warn you if one of your r hats is greater than 1.1, so this should be as close to one as you can possibly get it. In this case, the r hat associated with data is pretty much one, so we're good here. There are other diagnostics we can check, but these two will suffice for beginners for now. After confirming that the effective sample size and r hat are acceptable, we can treat our resulting MCMC sample as a reasonable approximation to the posterior distribution. Now that you've established that you have a usable MCMC sample, how do you actually use it? As we saw earlier, the summary function can provide you with a lot of useful information, but we're going to get our hands dirty. We currently have a fitted model, but we can easily extract the posterior sample from it using the asDrawsDF function to convert it into a data frame. You can see that it has five columns. One column is theta, another is for LP, and the other three columns give us some information about the MCMC itself. What we're really interested in are the samples for theta. In theory, these samples come from the posterior distribution of theta. Normally, we wouldn't know the precise distribution, but remember that we used the beta prior. In the data we generated, we saw six successes. So, the posterior distribution is a beta distribution with parameters 7 and 15. If we look at the empirical histogram of the sample and compare it to the theoretical distribution, you'll see that it's pretty close. As long as your metrics are good, you can treat the sample as a close approximation, even if you don't know the exact form behind it. Working with the sample in this way might feel strange to you, especially if this is your first time using Bayesian statistics. So to demonstrate how we can use it, let me teach you through a quick aside. I'm going to generate 1000 samples from a standard uniform distribution. Like the posterior distribution, we'll have a bunch of numbers that are realizations of the standard uniform. By themselves, they don't tell us much, but in the aggregate, we can retrieve the properties of the population distribution that generated them. For example, we know that the expectation of a standard uniform is one half. You can derive that using integration, but with the sample, we can calculate it with the sample mean. You can see that it's pretty close to 0.5, but it's a little bit off because we're dealing with the finite sample. Well, we also know that the law of large numbers tells us that the sample mean will converge to the population mean or expectation as the sample size grows to infinity. And this is key here. The law of large numbers helps us link the sample values back to their population equivalents. Here's a second example. Let's say that I want to calculate the probability that the standard uniform is greater than 0.75. Like before, we can calculate this probability from the general definition of accumulative probability. With our uniform sample, this is still taking the mean, but we're taking the mean of a bunch of indicator variables that take the value 1 if the number is greater than 0.75 and 0 otherwise. Again, the law of large numbers tells us that we just need to generate a large enough number of samples to get a really good approximation of the true probability. The logic behind these calculations exactly applies to our posterior sample as well. Want to know what the posterior probability that data is greater than 0.3? Just calculate the proportion. Want to know the 95% credible interval? Just get the 2.5 and 97.5 quantiles from the sample. That being said, if you can avoid it, I would highly recommend that you don't write your own STAN programs. There are several R libraries that contain pre-compiled STAN models that are more efficient and produce more stable MCMC samples. I personally recommend using the BRMS library for all your regression needs because it includes linear regressions, GLMs, and mixed effects models. The functions in BRMS allows you to use a similar syntax that you'd use in the frequentist versions of the models. Another library I've heard good things about is rstanarm. I haven't used it much myself, but it does many of the same things that BRMS does. If you really need to work with stan directly, then I recommend downloading the command stan r library. It provides an r interface for working with command stan, a command line interface for stan. You can also use rstan like I have in this video, but I think that command stan r provides a better experience for working with stan models than working with the resulting MCMC samples. That's it for this short course on Bayesian statistics. I hope that I've convinced you to be a little more Bayesian in your life. If you like what you saw, then I hope you like the video and subscribe if you aren't already. We're so close to getting 100k, and I'd love to achieve this before my graduation. I upload statistics content weekly, and you can get notified about new videos and extra content if you sign up for the channel newsletter. Alright, see you in the next one.